I like what I see, Jubilee. <laughs> you are the living proof of John 21. Jesus prayed his high priestly prayer in that gruesome garden of Gethsemane, and he said, Father, make them one as you and I are one. Make them one. Why? So that the world might believe that you have sent me. And I believe that uh, this audience, this movement, is an ocular demonstration of what he wants his kingdom to be. You are living proof that it really does not matter if you're black or white, yellow or brown, rich or poor, up or down, suburbanite or urbanite, in the city, out of the city, if you are um, um, a Republican or a Democrat, a liberal or a conservative, a hawk or a dove, as long as Jesus Christ is the center and circumference, the sum and substance, the basis and boundary of all that we ever hope to be, then we can be a picture of transformation, reconciliation, redemption, and unity. And you are doing that. I have to tell you, saying amen to a black preacher is like saying sick him to a dog. <laughs> and so I have about 20 minutes, I'm told, and if I'm going to finish in 20 minutes, if you hear something that's true every now and then, I'd like to hear you say amen, or we'll be here all night. <laughs> Listen, um, God exists. <laughs> there never was a time that he did not exist. God exists. Amen. In fact, anyone who's been intellectually honest would have to go up and say, if I look beyond the sky, there's something up there. God exists, whether I know it or not, believe it or not, like it or not, or accept it or not, God exists. Two, God has revealed himself. He is not trying to hide. He's revealed himself in creation. He has revealed himself in our consciences. He's revealed himself through Christ Jesus who came down to show us him. He's revealed himself in the canon of scripture which we call the Holy Bible. God exists. God has revealed himself. God has a plan for the universe. We have night, we have day, we have the sun that sets in the east and the sun that uh, it rises in the east, it sets in the west. We have all of the seasons of winter, spring, fall, and summer. He has a set plan for the universe. Fourthly, God has a plan for humans. Surely if he has a plan for the universe, he has a plan for the crowning glory of his creation, the capstone of his genius. So God exists, God has revealed himself, God has a plan for the universe, God has a plan for humans. Five, you are human. Wake up the person next to you. You are human, therefore, God has a plan for you. And since God has a plan for you, then you owe God an honest hearing. You and I owe God an honest hearing. So I want you to hear what he has to say tonight. Because the word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces asunder between the joints and the marrow, the soul and the spirit. It is a critic of the thoughts and the intent of the heart. All scripture is God-breathed, and as such, it is profitable for reproof, rebuke, correction, and instruction in righteousness. The psalmist says, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful, but his delight, her delight, his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in that law does he meditate, does she meditate, meditate day and night. And as a result, he or she shall be like a tree that's planted by the rivers of water. Leaves will come in due season and whatsoever he 
he or she does shall prosper. I believe like you do that the word of God is untainted and unmixed with error in its original autograph, it's divine in its origin, inspired in its totality, it's regenerative in its power, inexhaustible in its adequacy, but personal in its application. That's a good place to say amen. 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 I got a problem tonight. I had a fabulous sermon prepared. And God did something I don't like him to do. <laughs> and I've been here since Friday, um, last night and today. Um, God began to move me from my sermon. In fact, just two hours ago, I went to the video team and said, um, they were going over what I had given. And I said, um, And I don't like it when God does that. But just know for the record, whatever this turns out to be, you were about to hear one of the greatest sermons that ever been preached. <laughs> but honestly, whenever God leads in this direction, though I'm uncomfortable with it, he knows more about living than any person who's ever lived. So I'm going to follow, even though it doesn't make sense to me, what he would have me to say. So there is a passage in Matthew chapter 5, verse 5. Whatever else redemption is, Jesus came to radically redeem our attitude. That's why he spent so much time in the embryonic stages of his ministry and what we call the Sermon on the Mount, but he over and over taught his disciples about attitude. And when he redeems us, he radically redeems our attitude. And so he gives us this passage, Matthew 5.5. 5. I want you to repeat it after me with vim, vigor, and vitality, would you? <laughs> Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. This word meek, pros in the Greek, is perhaps one of the most misunderstood words in the Bible, in our English language. It does not mean weak. So when Jesus gave these beatitudes, he said, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. That's the beatitude of salvation. When I come and I'm spiritually bankrupt before God, then he opens a whole new world up for me. But I have to admit that I'm spiritually bankrupt and in and of myself, I cannot save myself. My salvation is through Christ alone, through grace alone, through faith alone. It is not true that God helps those who help themselves. God helps those who let him help them. So that's the beatitude of salvation. Then he says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. That's the beatitude of suffering. See, this is a radical, redemptive attitude change. And then he says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. This is the beatitude of submission, a nasty word in our English language, submission, blessed or the meek. Now you know meek is not weak because Jesus himself said in John, I mean Matthew 11, that I am lowly and I am meek, so learn this from me. In fact, we have Moses in the Old Testament. There was nothing weak about him either, but in his day, the Bible says he was the meekest man on earth in his day. So what does God want us to learn about redemption with this idea of meekness? So I want to share a few definitions and a couple of stories, and then I will take my seat. Whatever else meekness is, blessed 
are the meek. This word blessed means in a happiness, by the way. It's, it's, it's a lasting satisfaction. It's not based on external circumstances. So Jesus speaking even to his population who were poor, who were enslaved, said that your circumstances do not determine your inner happiness or your lasting satisfaction. But here is the condition. Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth, meaning that God will give you and I by inheritance what we need, a lot of what we want without undue strain, stress, or struggle. It will be an inheritance, but I have to have this particular attitude. What is meekness? Meekness means an attitude of acceptance of what the Almighty is doing to me and through me without fighting. That's meekness. It's an attitude of acceptance of what the Almighty is doing to me and through me, clue, without fighting. Some of us, even in our redemptive state, are fighting with God. I know I do. I don't like sometimes what God is doing to me, and I don't like sometimes what he's doing through me, including not preaching the sermon that I wanted to preach. <laughs> but it's an acceptance of what the Almighty is doing to me and through me without fighting. Now, you would probably never know it, but uh, I never wanted to be a preacher. Uh, I was in business. I love being a business person. And in fact, I married my wife, 1984. She said, on one condition, I don't want to marry a preacher. I said, you don't have to worry about that. I would never be a preacher. I meant that with all my heart. And, and then God began to stir in my heart of all things to be a preacher pastor. And I said, God, I can't, I can't do that because I'll lose my marriage. I promised my <laughs> wife that I would never be a preacher. And I had no intention of doing that. Meekness is an attitude of acceptance of what the Almighty is doing to me and through me without fighting. So I went to Houston Baptist University, had no idea what I was doing. First in my family to ever go to college, drove up on the campus. I make a long story short, by some miracle, I got accepted. And then I saw the bill. I didn't know Houston Baptist was on the quarter system. The bill was $3,000 tuition, not including books. I looked at that. I said, oh, well, that's that. The registrar obviously saw the discouragement on my face. And she said, go across the median and talk to Dr. Wolford. He might be able to help you. I walked into Dr. Wolford's office. He was sitting at his desk. He didn't even look up. He just sat there and he said, yes, sir, how can I help you? I said, well, the register said I should come over and talk to you. He said, uh, uh, do you want to go in ministry? I said, no, sir. He said, well, what are you here for? I said, I want to teach the Bible. He said, well, that's ministry. Do you want to go in ministry? I said, no, sir. He said, well, what are you here for? I said, because I want to teach the Bible. He said, well, young man, that's ministry. Do you want to go in ministry? I said, no, sir. <laughs> I did not want to be a preacher. All I wanted to do was teach the Bible, high school, elementary school, maybe college. That's all I wanted to do. And he said, uh, but anything you do as a Christian, that is ministry. Now, do you want to go in ministry? I said, no, sir. <laughs> Here is the problem. Dr. Wolford and I had a miscommunication. When he said ministry, he meant one thing. When I said ministry, I meant preaching in the black church. I was not as animated. I wasn't as demonstrated. I didn't have a violin in my voice. I didn't sweat. I, I didn't do this. I didn't do that. And, and, and so, so when he said ministry, I thought he was saying, do you want to be like O.C. Johnson or Leo Daniel or Jasper Williams? So I said, absolutely not. I don't have that, those kinds of gifts and demonstrativeness. I'm an introvert by nature. And so he said, do you want to go in ministry? I almost said, no, sir, I don't again. But I knew he wanted me to say yes. So to further the conversation, I said, yes, I want to go in ministry. He said, well, good. Watch this. 
A young man two days ago dropped out of the ministry track, transferred to another school. I have a 40% scholarship if you want to go in ministry. Now, do you want to go in ministry? I said, yes, sir. <laughs> Blessed are the meek, those who have an attitude of acceptance with what the Almighty is doing to them and through them without whatever else meekness is. Meekness is strength under control. It's the picture of a horse. It is strength under control. Control. So when God redeems me, it goes against my nature. It's counterintuitive because I want to be in charge. But it is strength under control. Jesus said blessedness, inner happiness belongs to those who have strength under control. Blessedness, meekness is submission to the rider who knows more about the race of life than I do. That's what meekness is. It means to submit to the rider who knows more about racing than I do. Whatever else meekness is, it means to trust the one who has the reins of my destiny in his hand. So meekness is strength under control. It's submitting to the rider who knows more about the race than I do. It means trusting the one who has the reins of my destiny in his hand. I don't know if you're a race fan, but in 2009, a horse by the name of Mind That Bird, M-I-N-E, Mind That Bird, entered the Kentucky Derby. He was a long shot. Nobody believed he could do it. He was a crooked-legged, underweight thoroughbred, but he was tried out by Calvin Burrell. Calvin Burrell had won the Kentucky Derby twice. He tried out mind that bird and he said, I will risk my reputation and ride mind that bird. Why? Because he said, mind that bird had a domesticated spirit, a meek spirit, and he paid attention to the rider. There were only two people who believed mind that bird had a chance, Chip Woolley, who was his trainer, and Calvin Burrell, who was the jockey. Now, mind that bird was bigger than Calvin Burrell, faster than Calvin Burrell. He had a mind of his own, but what mind that bird did that day made Kentucky Derby history because he came from 50 to 1 odds to win the Kentucky Derby. Why? He submitted himself to the rider who knew more about the race than he did, and he trusted the one who had the reins of his destiny in his hand. I almost feel like preaching. So whatever else meekness is, it is submitting to the rider who knows more about the race of life than I do. That's part of what God is redeeming my attitude. He's radically redeeming that. It means trusting the reins of my destiny to the one who knows more about living than any man that has ever lived. Meekness means to be strong enough to be weak enough to let God handle it. Meekness is to be strong enough to be weak enough to let God handle it. We all have our own strength, our own will, our own independence where we want to do things our way, but meekness means being strong enough to be weak enough to let God handle it. Lastly, meekness is the middle part of anger. It's not pacifist, which means you never get upset at anything. It is not an activist, which means you get angry about everything. Aristotle says meekness is the middle part of anger. It's a balance. And so whatever else meekness is, it means to have strength 
under control. It's not being a pacifist, never being upset about anything or an activist protesting and getting angry about everything. It's the middle part of anger. So when Jesus says to me, you, I'm lowly and I am meek, so learn that from me. I'll close with this. Moses, Numbers chapter 12. And you know Moses had a temper, don't you? He murdered a man with his bare hand because he offended his brother. But over time, his attitude was radically redeemed. And in Numbers chapter 12, by the time they came to this, Moses remarried. He married a Cushite woman, Numbers chapter 12 says. And his brother, Aaron, older brother, and older sister didn't like it. In fact, they said, why didn't you consult with us? You're not the only one that God speaks through. In fact, Aaron said, if it wasn't for me, you wouldn't even be able to speak, Moses. God told you to go tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And you said, I got a stammering tongue. I stutter. I can't get the message right. You couldn't even go before Pharaoh and say, let my people go. I had to do that for you. And you wouldn't dare consult me on major decisions. And Miriam, the big sister, said, boy, if it wasn't for me, you wouldn't even be alive. I was the one who concocted with mama this whole scheme to see you floating down the aisle and said to Pharaoh's daughter, oh, look at that precious baby over there. And your own mama ended up nursing you and you won't consult me when you have major decisions. Here's what the Bible says, Numbers 12, 3. And Moses was very meek. He said nothing. And the Lord heard it. Strong enough to be weak enough to let God handle it. Because when I put it in my hands, I often take it out of God's hands. And God said to Aaron and to Miriam and to Moses, you three come out, I wanna to talk to you. Now listen, you don't wanna hear God say, you three come out. <laughs> but Moses, was very meek. He had learned over time to be strong enough, to be weak enough to let God handle it. He had learned over time the middle part of anger. I hope I'm talking to somebody who may be struggling in your redemptive state with what God is doing to you and through you and you fighting. And he's saying, I want you to be strong enough to be weak enough to let me handle it. I want you to have strength under control. I want you to submit to the rider who knows more about the race of life than you do. I want you to trust the one who has the reins of your destiny in your hand. I close with this. Jesus, who said he was lowly and who said he was meek, taught us this, it's not easy when I have the choice or don't have the choice. God puts me in a box, put me in a situation, back is up against the wall, I have nobody to call on but God. Then I am often meek. It's not easy, but I'm more likely to be meek, to have strength under control. But here's my test for you. Real meekness is tested when I can do something about a situation, but I choose not to. Because if I choose to do it, it would take the matters out of God's hand. And I may be talking to somebody who may be in both of those situations. My back is up against the wall, and yes, I am submitting to the rider who knows more about the race of life than I do. I don't know what to do, and so I am in submission to him. But I'm also talking to somebody who's been maligned, who's been mistreated, uh, and who has been vilified, and you can do something about it. Here is the challenge for you in your redemptive state, and it is this. Are you strong enough to be weak enough to let God handle it? So Jesus redeemed us. He said, I am lowly and I am meek. 
And the one who is meek can show us how to be meek. You do know that he had a chance to fight against God. In that gruesome garden of Gethsemane, when he cried out to the Father, if there be any other plan, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. That's what he was doing. He had an attitude of acceptance of what God was doing to him and through him without fighting God. He showed us the way on how to have strength under control. And that same meek one can also show us how to be meek in our radically redemptive state. And that's what he wants to do for you and for me. Jesus, the one who was conceived in virginity, he was born in humility, he was wrapped in humanity, he lived 30 years in obscurity, he healed indiscriminately, served selflessly, preached poignantly, talked tirelessly, prayed fervently, suffered silently, died vicariously, rose victoriously, he returned very gloriously. And he has redeemed, radically redeemed, yours and my attitudes. So blessed are the, not the weak, but they and only they shall inherit the earth. God will give you and give me what we need and a lot of what we want without undue stress, strain, and struggle while we're on earth to represent him. Now let me, let me give this invitation. If you don't mind, I'm gonna ask those who are CCO staff, if they will come in the aisles, come up front. You've heard a lot these last couple of days. This is an opportunity, if you are so led, to speak with someone who is on staff here at CCO, they can pray with you, they can pray for you. And I want to challenge two groups tonight, if you're so led. One, if you are here tonight without Christ, without hope, without eternal life, we want you to know that Jesus Christ had you personally in mind when he went to the cross. And every sin that you've ever committed, past, present, and future, was nailed to him on the cross. And he who knew no sin became sin so that we might have the righteousness of God. So sitting right where you are, inaudibly, without saying a word, you can tell God the Father that I am believing on Jesus Christ. In fact, if you are here tonight, it's because God made the first move and he's already been stirring in your heart. You can tell him that I'm believing in Jesus Christ. In fact, you can surrender and be meek. And that submission will bring eternal life, another quality of life to you. If that's you, then I want you to come. Secondly, there may be somebody here who say, Pastor Rufus, if I'm being honest, I'm in a controversy with God. I'm fighting. If I'm being honest, I've let my anger get the best of me, not the middle part of anger. If I'm being honest, I need to submit to the one who knows more about the race of life than I do. And if that's you, I want to encourage you to come. I don't know what the major street in Pittsburgh is. What is it? What is it? All right. Penn Avenue. Let, 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 let. Let's imagine at Penn Avenue that I left here tonight and I saw Jesus on the side of the road, hitchhiking a ride. You know what I do? I say, Lord, you don't have to hitchhike. You are my Lord and Savior. I'd get out my car, open the back door, and I'd say, Lord, ride with me. You know what he would say, Rufus? I don't ride in the back. 
I would say, Lord, wait a minute, great people ride in the back, kings and potentates, presidents, they ride in the back. You are much greater than they. Ride with me. He'd say, but I don't ride in the back. So I closed that door and I'd go to the side and I said, Lord, ride with me. He said, Rufus, I don't ride on the side. I said, wait a minute, Lord, the people I love ride on the side. My children, my wife rides on the side. My friends, and you are greater than any of them, ride on the side. He said, no, I don't ride on the side. So he closed the door and I said, well, Lord, if you don't want to ride in the back and if you don't want to ride on the side, where do you want to ride? You know what he say? Give me the keys. Because if I'm going to ride, then I've got to do the driving. Somebody here tonight, God wants you to give up the keys and let him drive. Blessed are the meek, for they and only they shall inherit the earth. 